There we go. Good afternoon, uh, students. This is uh, our replacement lecture because we lost a snow day, but we didn't want to take anything away from Professor Roden's discussion of uh, Japan. And so uh, we're going to do our uh, Giovanni Boccaccio, and The Plague and Black Death, and you'll um, watch it on your own time so that we can stick to the schedule for the midterm and then move on to the uh, second half of uh, classes. So you have uh, readings, which I hope you already did. We picked just four uh, stories out of a hundred. I'll get uh, to Giovanni Boccaccio and those stories. But first I want to talk a little bit about the plague, which is a fundamental interruption of the development of a high city culture in Europe, which begins around 1200 it continues, I like to use the date 1492, uh, not so much because Columbus discovered America that we did that year, but because that's the, the death of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And that uh, marks very clearly the end of the, the beginning of the decline of Florence as a great city state. And after 1492, fueled in part by the expansion of Europe into the New World and the great wealth that flows in, City-states, cities still exist, but city-states will give way to nation-states, and that's part of the, for, for Europe, the post-spring uh, break that we will look at the, uh, how, how love exists when there are great nation-states. So uh, this is the, uh, the period of the city-state, the period of a, a scribe culture as opposed to a print culture. And it is marked by this dramatic crisis with the plague in 1348, um, sort of right at the halfway point of the three centuries that we're dealing with. And so it is remarkable that the city-state survives this demographic uh, catastrophe, and historians have um, thought and, and redeveloped ideas about that, which is what I want to go into in part today. But before you listen to me in a more academic sense, I hope that you will have watched our little video of the Hollaback Girl uh, describing the play, because that is good history. That is accurate, and you might actually remember. You, did you like yeah, that Yeah, I one? enjoyed it. Great. Right. Really. Okay. So since we don't have the 100-plus of you in, in Van Dyke 211, uh, <laughs> we have Nick behind the uh, camera, and uh, we have Maxine sitting here next to me, and she's the audience of 100-plus. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to intervene yes. whenever. Well, I can try and be the audience too. And, and Nick can also, <laughs> speak, even though so 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 we're trying to make this into a, a sort of a sort of classroom situation. So any so, so you've watched the um, Hollaback Girl, and I certify to the accuracy of the uh, the content uh, of it. I think it's very good, and uh, we want to begin. Now the other thing I should say is that I think. What all of you can do is, uh, when you've uh, clicked on to this video of me, it's really just me and Maxine that you see, and Nick if he puts his hand in front of the uh, camera. <laughs> but uh, basically, you can keep the sound going and turn to the notes, because we have some of them up here, like the map on the screen, but you're not going to be able to see that very well. And you'll see it much better on your own. So just you know, f put me down into the minimize and keep the voice going and uh, follow along in the in the notes which are which are up there and I think that's be the ideal way to have a look at this. So uh, following on the map now and um, we're gonna we're gonna date this play as beginning at the end of 1347 when we have the first records of it in Sicily. Uh, already this controversy there's uh, I mean the, the Hollebeck video didn't have time to go into the three different kinds of plague but in essence the the biggie uh, the, uh, most of the people had was a bubonic plague, uh, but there's also a pneumonic plague where you don't have these buboes under your armpits and so forth and in the groin area, but uh, the, the plague attacks your lungs. And that comes in the winter time. And um, then there's also a septicemic plague, which is a blood to blood uh, kind of contact, and that's rare but even more fatal. People did survive bubonic plague. Some of them recovered, and they developed an immunity to it, 
which um, you protect it for years until a recycling. So plague comes, tends to come in 10 year cycles and if you're lucky enough to have a mild case of it, not, not unlike mumps or something, uh, you, you, then you, you, you'd be uh, immune um, to it. So. 1347, Sicily isn't as cold as the rest of the Europe, and so maybe there was still bubonic uh, type plague transmitted by rats, uh, the fleas jumping from the, the rat to the human being. In colder places, the, the, wouldn't, the, the fleas would have died even if the rats uh, survived. So maybe it was um, pneumonic, but more likely it was bubonic in a, in a warmer climate. And the understanding at that time, it's probably true, is that this plague came from Central Asia where it was endemic. And so ships trading along the Black Sea that's uh, hot in the news uh, because of Ukraine and uh, so forth, uh, came down this way and we had the earliest outbreaks from Sicily, Sardinia, and Marseille in France. So all areas that probably didn't have a heavy freeze. By the following summer, 1348, that's the big one. The plague now devastates as far as uh, Paris, absolutely Venice, the areas that we're focusing on, uh, Florence, Siena, the central Tuscan areas, so this, this huge band. Now, there are pockets where there isn't plague, and those have remained very mysterious to historians. You see one uh, here in uh, western France, the city of Milan was another one. It got hit hard in 1360, but not in the 1348 plague. Either they closed their city gates early enough or the kinds of goods that they were trading in didn't have ships with rats, uh, with fleas uh, as, as frequently, or you can, like Boccaccio, believe that God decided to devastate some cities and not others. But our modern understanding of things is that uh, we are looking at the transmission through the fleas and then we see this band expanding. Now that is a, a winter uh, band, uh, December, so it gets into the mountains. How can that be? It's probably pneumonic plague. It's got lots of people indoors. It's cold. The areas are less populated. These are not areas you can't put a ship in the middle of the Alps. So that isn't where uh, they're coming from. Uh, and then we get the next big expansion in the spring, spring and summer of the following year where we get devastating uh, outbreaks in uh, the British Isles, and then further north, and basically you're looking at a map of European commerce where you see less commerce way up here in the north. It's not only colder, and that's not as difficult for the fleas, but uh, there is not uh, active trading routes going on. Okay, so uh, plague kills between one-third and one-half of the population. It does so very unevenly. It's um, 80 and 90 percent in downtown Florence and central Siena, the f two years later in uh, parts of London, and other areas much less. But uh, a population loss of a third to a half the population is far greater on a percentage basis than any other epidemics that we know of for Europe. Now, Justinian's plague, 7th century, Central Asia, that was also very, very devastating. But um, but it's not in our European setting. So for our uh, European people, this is of a magnitude never heard of uh, before. And if we were live in class instead of snowed out, I'd have half of you stand up and say, now you're dead. And, uh, but I can't let Nick turn off the camera. And I don't want to get rid of Maxine here. So yeah, my, uh, you know, just, she disappears, okay? One of us is gone. I am more likely a younger person, actually. Um, so there's a very, very really? devastating um, uh, outbreak. The cities had much higher rates than the countryside. Uh, we assume that uh, there were just more people for the fleas to jump off the rats and bite in the close yeah. city areas. Um, there was also, people did really foolish things, like take the clothing of the dead people and put it on themselves 
with the fleas still there. This was a bad choice. Uh, they figured that out, that, that somehow using the clothes of uh, people who had plague was a, was a big mistake and that they were much better off burning them, but they didn't figure it out initially because they had very little sense of why um, any of this uh, was happening. One of the uh, early um, suppositions was that the Jews must have done this. Uh, the Jews had somehow poisoned the wells. That's mentioned in your Hollaback Girl. Uh, so anti-Semitic riots broke out in many cities. Uh, Jews were also heavily involved in uh, the exchanging and selling of used clothing. So in fact, they were purveyors of plague. Uh, so that I mean, there's a historical economic basis that this was indeed the case, that if you got near the, the used clothing seller... But not how they understood it back then, right? Uh, no, they did not. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't think they, that was they, the un reason. they understood that if you burned all the possessions of the person who died, that was a good idea. Yeah. If okay. you dumped the body on the street real fast, that was a good idea. If you didn't sit around doing a funeral, because they didn't do embalming, they didn't... Mm -hmm. Egyptians knew about embalming, but the Florentines did not. Um, so, so they knew that there was something about the body that was contagious, but they didn't have the rat, flea, bite right. sequence uh, yeah, understood. Uh, nonetheless, if the, the Jewish used clothing salesman wheeled his cart by today and tomorrow that whole house came down with plague, <laughs> uh, people blamed the, uh, the Jewish uh, clothing seller and they were not wrong. Uh, it probably did have um, fleas uh, and or, or rats in the situation. Now, uh, as the cities emptied out, people in the countryside, the country bumpkins, I jokingly call them, said, why am I sitting here, you know, working from sunrise till sunset? There's all these riches in the cities. I think I'll go to the city and... Um, uh, find, a, find my fortune, and there were all these empty houses because so many people had died. We had 60 or 70 percent. I mean, the whole house got wiped out. Mm -hmm. So you could become a squatter. So you could move from the Tuscan countryside into Florence or Siena, and you'd find a house. You'd find the clothing if you were gutsy enough to put it on, which if you waited a few weeks till after everybody was dead, it'd be all right if there's still stuff in the closet. The fleas won't stay that long. Uh, they, they need to keep eating, uh, sucking blood. And so um, the serfs left the land. They weren't going to work anymore at 50-50 and, and work hard. Um, so you've got all these squatters now in the city. The, um, the wealth that had existed is now concentrated in fewer hands. Uh, if half the population dies, all of the hard wealth, all of the gold coins, all of the paintings, all of the fabulous uh, statues that are around, all of the silk cloths, all of the shoes, everything is now divided among half as many people, or far less than that if you're in Florence. So simply by going around and picking up stuff after the dead people, you could get to be um, quite well off. Wages shot up. Uh, there were fewer workers. Even counting all the people who left the, the land to come to the city, workers were in very short supply. So uh, all of the students that know about supply-demand economics, you have desperately needed, you're able to charge more wages per day for whatever job. So this was a very good time for the for working class wages. Um, luxury prices went way up. So uh, people who did survive had more money and they could afford to pay more for goods. So you had inflation of prices, inflation of wages. The people who didn't do so well were the owners of large tracts of land, land that had been cultivated intensively, I'm particularly thinking of the land around a monastery for example, which would have had lots of serfs, the monks didn't do all the work, the Benedictines a little, but no, not mostly. Uh, and so the, the serfs left, the land is there, nobody can be bothered with intensive agriculture, so the land went to pasturage, the growing of grasses, and animals grazing on the grasses. So now suddenly, instead of having to eat coarse bread 
and foul tasting barley and so forth, you could have a nice steak. Nice. Uh, so people who survived ate better. Yeah. Uh, they could uh, they could afford it with their high wages, and uh, so animal protein is always much more expensive to produce than uh, legumes and, and things like that. So we get a. a Turning to, to pasturage, uh, increasing use of meat. I don't mean that every day they put a steak on, <laughs> but, but there was an increasing availability of uh, proteins. Um, the church definitely lost out because without having lots of peasants to do the, the work and exploit the land, um, they, their economic base of the monasteries particularly declined, as they did that of the large landowners. If you don't have somebody to work your land, it just it doesn't, it doesn't become very much. Those who engaged in capitalism, liquid capital, did best. Okay? If you had hordes of cash, that was a very good thing. If you had some money and you could then invest in bringing in a ship, say, of spices from North Africa, that was a super winner. You had people who could afford to pay for it. You also had people who thought that eating a lot of spices would keep away the plague, which is an interesting uh, notion, but okay. And um, so if you could take risks, if you could pool your money, then you were going to be better off. So it is the rise of, I don't want to call them capitalists a little too soon, but proto-capitalists or pre-capitalists or commercial entrepreneurs Having, you could also have goods if you had bolts of really good, high quality woolens, or you had silks, that was also as good as gold. Uh, but, but these kinds of liquid assets uh, were very, very valuable. They increase in value, and when we get the first beginnings of putting together um, capital accumulations into groups, so you know, maybe I, I'm a survivor of the plague, I don't have enough money to buy a whole ship, but with 10 other people, I get together and we can become co-investors, that is, stockholders, in a ship that we send uh, around uh, the Horn or whatever and, and do, do very well. Uh, so new trade routes open up. And this is the, the plague is good for you theory that I'm moving towards. So the initial view was, oh, plague is horrible. You, know, you get this ugly disease and you get these booboos and you die. But uh, no. It turns out that if you divide all of the wealth into half as many people, there's a lot left over and you can do fabulous things with it. And the two fabulous things that happened, just to cut to the chase here, are that the Italian Renaissance booms. So suddenly uh, you can afford to hire Michelangelo and Botticelli and build St. Peter's Cathedral. Or you could be an English explorer and decide to conquer the new world. Um, or you could do a little of each, as the Iberians did. And so there, though, Columbus can't get a job in, in Genoa, but he goes to Spain and he's able to get the queen to say, okay, I'll hock one of my jewels. And, you, know, you can have three ships and you can go discover the new world. So it is uh, an age, it, it allows, because, I mean, this is 1348, the plague first hits. Already by the middle of the next century, so it takes a hundred years, but the Portuguese have explored all the way down the coast, I have a map, map but I don't, all the way down the coast of Africa, right to the, to the horn of Africa, the, the southern tip. Yeah. They're going to get around to India pretty soon. That's why they're going to be wanting to look. Columbus comes up with a brilliant idea of sail the other way and maybe we'll get there faster. Uh, and so, so this adventurism is rewarded. Faith in God, mm, it's tough, you know, it dealt a really heavy blow there in the middle of the 14th century. And so uh, maybe, maybe you need a little more self-initiative. The, the authority of the, the church is undermined, not only its economic base in the monasteries, but the, anybody's authority. I mean, this is a big, I can't figure this out kind of thing. Um, I mean, the threat of nuclear war in the 20th century, but didn't happen in you know, a right. global gigantic scale, uh, would be similar to the kind of fear that people, no, especially when the plague came back in 1360, 
from then on, I mean, the rest of that century, that was down the tubes. I mean, you, you, so what are you going to do? Just sit back and give up or uh, you, you, uh, try your best? But there were, there were people who just tried very, very hard. So we get, and money funnels, uh, the fuels that we get a, a renaissance in painting and in sculpture, a belief in human endeavor. I got to rely on myself. I might be dead tomorrow, but I'm going to do things myself, not, not just uh, wait on uh, God's help. Florence becomes much less willing to think of itself as the new Jerusalem. That's Dante. We just finished Dante, the, the notion of Florence as the center of the world, the, the place that Christ and Christianity has migrated from Jerusalem. That, that's gone. Um, the, the Rome becomes more important. The new world and discovery, the, the, the age has, has just changed. Gradually, and this is, um, you got to just use a mental map since I didn't draw one for you. When we started this course, the, the center of things was the Bible and we were in the Near East. We then kind of moved to Greece, uh, to, to Rome. Now, at the end of this period, at the end of the age of the cities, after 1500, we're going to move to Holland. And what we do at that map, at least. So we're going to move up here. And we're going to move here. That's where, and we're going to move out here. That's where the action is, right on this Atlantic. So it is no longer a Near Eastern or even a Mediterranean civilization. We've shifted to an Atlantic civilization. And we're going to be with this Atlantic civilization till. 1800, 1900, and then we're going to go to a global civilization. So that, that's where the, the big uh, sweep of things is going. And this is um, all a result of the, the plague and its demographic consequences, which there's no doubt about, which in turn create economic consequences. Okay, so here we are in the plague, and we have Giovanni Boccaccio writes this I think hysterically funny, he said, well, there's a lot of stories, okay, it's a pretty thick book, here. Uh, but we only have you read four of them, but that, that's all right. And uh, so now let's uh, shift gears a, a moment and talk a little bit about uh, Boccaccio himself. And um, I want to fill in uh, some biographical details, but as always, keep in mind that when we deal with an author, it is the author's times that matters. So where I want to go with this is, who read these stories? Why did they think they were funny? It cost a lot of money to make a copy of them and a lot of time to sit and listen to them. Most people listen to them being read aloud rather than um, reading them, but some people read them. So who had enough? Well, we just got through saying that since half the people were dead, the other half had twice as much money as they used to have. So they had money to make a copy of this, but, but who's the audience? So that's where we're going. Nonetheless, we start a little bit. So uh, Boccaccio is the um, love child, is that the right term for illegitimate? Yeah, okay. Uh, of, a, of a merchant. <laughs> and uh, the merchant and his wife, they don't have any children of their own, but uh, Boccaccio's father does uh, have this, this love child that um, the wife likes very much anyway. So. It's a very nice sort of stepmother kind of arrangement. And uh, dad is a, uh, a merchant banker, and he goes representing the, the Bardi Bank of Florence in Naples. And so this is in the 1330s, 40s. Uh, Boccaccio is about uh, 18, 19 years old, and he enrolls at the University of Naples one of the newer but very prestigious uh, universities and like many students who go to college instead of doing what uh, his father wants which is to learn how to be a good rich banker he goes off and studies classics and poetry that's that's what interests him and like many um, young men uh, in college he invents a lover an imaginary lover he calls a Fiametta, so Fiametta is hot flame, so he's got a hot lover. 
uh, and he writes poetry for Fiammetta, and we've seen the, the imaginary love with Dante and Beatrice at, at great length, and so maybe all of this is true, but maybe it's not, and it's just a, a poetic um, convention. Um, and uh, an excuse for, for writing poetry. Now, at this point, Boccaccio is very much, uh, Dante's the, the dominant poet for the uh, Italian peninsula for the 40s. He's dead by now, but anyway, his poetry is studied heavily in Naples. And the up-and-coming Petrarch. Uh, so, things are going along swimmingly. Dad is making money as a merchant banker. And um, then suddenly there's a financial crisis. Um, the, it's, a, it's a local and temporary thing, but um, Daddy calls little Giovanni back to Florence and says, time to get to work and you know, do some serious stuff and no more goofing around as a, as a permanent uh, student. That, uh, no, long, no sooner does he get back to Florence than his stepmother, the one who was nice to him, uh, dies of the plague in 1348, the first wave, and his father dies the next uh, year. So here he is, uh, an orphan uh, of a family that was doing well but is now uh, broke, uh, and he has no patron. Petrarch, when he writes poetry, he can do that all day long because he has a patron. And Dante lived off his wife's money and was in politics, and then he had the, the, uh, lived in the monastery where they took care of him. As you know, if you've read the stories, it's not likely that any monastery was going to provide food and drink to, uh, to our uh, Giovanni Boccaccio. So, he starts writing these stories. Now, here we're on more speculative ground. I believe that in the wake of the plague, Boccaccio came up with the brilliant idea of writing stories to make people laugh. And he set up a structure of a hundred stories, that is, ten stories by ten different storytellers each day, but that until he got it all done, quite a while later, he, there, nobody had the hundred stories, so somebody had day seven story two, and they laugh and they tell their neighbors about it. Ah, oh, you should get that one. Oh, I, I didn't realize he had gone that far. This is not like Lady Murasaki. Lady Murasaki wrote chapter by chapter, and Professor Roden has explained that people, oh, give me chapter two, give me chapter three, and it just went on and on, and she saw the reaction to a chapter. But I think... And, of course, she was well off, and she lived in a nice house. Uh, uh, Boccaccio was not an aristocrat. He needed money. And I think that he had just a few stories of the hundred, and he was selling those to copyists who were in turn selling. So he's really, to me, our first popular author publisher, long before the printing press, so it makes it much more expensive than, say, Charles Dickens, who used to write that kind of serial uh, sort of stuff, paid by the word, so to speak. So I think that Boccaccio also actually figured out that his audience were women. I think women were the primary readers of these stories. He says they were, and they, that was his intended audience, and uh, many critics for centuries dismissed that women couldn't read. Well, I don't think that's true. I think many more women could read, though we're not talking about going down to the uh, servants and the peasants coming right. in from the countryside. Yeah. But a good many Florentine women could read. Italian is a wonderful language, unlike English, that what's on the page is the way it sounds. So if you know p and d and b and t, and then it's all vowels, everything's in, in open vowels, it's a wonderful language. You just sit there with your finger and you can go along and, and read. And then it sounds like what it is. Italian has no words like eight, e-i-g-h-t. I mean, what, what kind of word is that? Nobody could, of course you can't read. It takes years to learn. To, but if you're Italian, you could read within about three months. And there's a, an interesting book that tells you how to learn to read in three months. So that's all it takes. No five years of so learning how to read. <laughs> and um, so I think that Boccaccio's use of coarse language and quick stories 
and stories, not poetry, was very intended to reach a popular audience. We would call it the audience that watches soap operas, mm. or that, um, what, what are those Japanese things called, the, 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 the little novelettes that they do now? Uh, I, I forget, and we don't have Professor Rowan mm -hmm. here in the library. Uh, they, they, they make them out of the tail of Genji and lots of things. They're almost like comic books. Oh, uh, uh, manga? Manga? Yeah, yeah, manga. That, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, at least there's somebody here that knows something. <laughs> okay, sure so, so he writes these stories, and even though you're only going to read four of them, I think that's what lots of Florentines did, because they couldn't find the other 96. And they certainly didn't have them bound together in this giant folio of some kind, they just had little pieces mm -hmm. so they could enjoy what they enjoyed. And you just had to believe that what uh, the, the opening where Boccaccio sets up, there are seven beautiful young women and then there are three men and um, they go out to the countryside to escape the plague and the rule is that they each have to tell a story each day so they tell their little stories. This is clearly a mockery of Dante and the uh, hundred cantos mm -hmm. and so, so he's doing a ten times ten, the seven of the seven virtues, the seven cardinal virtues. The three is the Trinity. He's making fun of that. So the three men uh, are the Trinity, and the seven virtues are the seven women. Uh, and but there's no nobody has ever figured out a rhyme or reason to who tells which kind of stories. And I think that is because Boccaccio was winging it uh, as he went along, and he didn't quite have the structure down to exactly balance the, the seven and three stories. So here we are, and he's so funny when you know the details. He has the seven women and the three men. They get together in the piazza in front of uh, Santa Maria Novella. So if we have students that have been in Florence, when you come out of the train station, that's the first big piazza that you see. And Santa Maria Novella was the church of what were disparagingly called the fat Dominicans, the ones who didn't fast very much during Lent or any other time. <laughs> And they had women in the uh, quarters there, uh, as opposed to Savonarola and the hard Dominicans who were over on the other side of town uh, in San Marco. So here they are in this beautiful square. It's right from the Porta Prato, which goes towards Bologna. You get out of the city. You're very quickly in the Cascina, the park with the nice green and so forth. So they're going to get away from the plague and tell funny stories. And so that's what these, um, these stories are about. Uh, so, and you have a picture of uh, Boccaccio here pointing at his sort of book in a more scholarly fashion. Now, what happened to Boccaccio is that um, Petrarch and some, well, mostly Petrarch, tell him that this is very bad writing these horrible things about the priests and the monks. And, so but then he better get serious. And so he disowns his own book. Uh, for, for years he says he didn't really write it. This is just some slander that, that said that uh, he wrote. And uh, instead he becomes a, an ambassador for the city of Florence and he writes this hugely hostile to women book, uh, the Cobaccio. The women are they're crows, they're black crows. And then he writes about a, a book on famous women, they all end up killing themselves. Yeah. You know, they're defending themselves from charges of rape or, you know, Judith. Or, so they're all women who kill themselves. And uh, so concerning famous women, another strange kind of book is, um, is all I could um, say. So uh, that's our um, Boccaccio. All right, ten days, ten stories equals a hundred equals Dante. The yeah, let me let me interrupt here just with a little bit of reading before we get to the story. I want to go to the conclusion, which I did add to the notes there, so it's uh, long on page uh, uh, three, four, five of the notes. And um, you know, you're not going to be tested on it. I added them later. Um, it's okay. I added them after you printed off your notes, Maxine. No, I got them. Oh, you got them. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. So I highlighted them for you. They make the argument, and I think it's part of Boccaccio's funniest argument, that I meant to write this for women, and I meant to write this for women who have a sense of humor and are not prudes, and so I defend myself in this way. And I think that the, the wording is just so 
modern. It's very, very interesting. So down here towards the bottom of page three. Some of you will say that I've used too much license in editing these stories. He's pretending that, you know, he was just overhearing these stories from the seven women and the three men who went out in the countryside. As well as in making ladies, uh, while saying very often hear things, that it's not very seemly for them to hear. A modest woman wouldn't talk like that. I deny this. There's nothing so unseemly as to be forbidden unto anyone if he expresses it in seemly terms. So, why did I do it? Why did I write what I wrote? I couldn't re write the story any other way without... Uh, it wouldn't have made any sense. So, I mean, isn't that really true for the Alebeck? Uh, yeah. I mean, how, how else could you write that story? You, you have to. Like, that's yeah. the way you have to go about it. Like, you yeah. can't, like, um, censor any of that. You, yeah. need, you need those explicit details. That's what makes it fun. Yeah. Right? Even yeah. today, I gave it to some of my friends in my dorm, and they were, like, hysterically laughing. That yeah. was amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a great story. Okay. Uh, now, and then I think this is this is pure Boccaccio. If perchance, I'm in the, so the top middle of page four. If perchance there be therein some tittle, some wordlet or two freer maybe than a squeamish person would like, some hypocritical prude, who they weigh words rather than deeds and study more to appear than to actually be good, I say no more should it be for me to, forbidden to write words than it is... Um, for men and women all day long to say words like hole and peg and mortar and pestle and sausage. I mean, this is just very funny, even in the English translation. But, you know, so he's, 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 a wiener is a wiener. And, uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> if you think it's something else, that's your problem. You know, it, he's a, uh, so there's pegs and there's holes, and that's the way it is. Uh, and in any event, now I'm getting a little further down on the page, these are things that were spoken. They were not in church. We were out in the countryside telling funny stories. So we were in the gardens, places of pleasant diversion, among men, men and women, though young, yet they're old enough not to be led astray by such stories. So they're, they're able to listen to these stories. Like everything else, these stories can harm and profit according to the disposition of the listener. So if you have a dirty mind, that's your problem. <laughs> And then further down, corrupt minds never understood a word healthfully. And even as seemly a word uh, do not profit depraved minds. So those which are not altogether seemly uh, shouldn't dispose the well, uh, shouldn't contaminate the well disposed. Any more that mire can sully the rays of the sun or earthly foulness the beauties of the sky. Uh, and then the bottom of that page, whoever has to say paternosters, that is the Our Fathers, or to make tarts and pudding for her spiritual director, let her leave them be. They will not run after any to make her read them. Uh, your she saints now and again do fine things. So what is the, you know, if you can't, uh, you want to bake cookies? What, what did Hillary Clinton say? Uh, I don't bake cookies, something like that. You know, she doesn't go to the kitchen. So if, if you think that your job is to sit there and bake cookies, now what does that, what does that tell me? You know, it tells me that this is a pretty wide audience. It isn't, I mean, an aristocratic woman wouldn't be baking cookies and tarts anyway. Right. So I think this is that merchant class that his father was and that he grew up with and that these are literate people who maybe don't depend on servants to do everything uh, for them. But he's basically, and this is hundreds of years ago, saying, you know, if you want to be a house proud, that's your problem. Uh, I'm interested in women who have time and enjoy uh, reading funny stories about sex. Okay. Um, middle of page five. It hath not therefore escaped my memory that I proffered this my travail, my work, to idle women and not to others. He's only interested in idle women. <laughs> Those who read to pass the time. Nothing can be too long. So yeah, now he's making fun of the people who said the stories are too long. I know. These women have plenty of time to read. <laughs> Things brief are far better suited unto students, he's going to stick it to students, who study not to pass away, but usefully to employ time than to you ladies. So if you're some college student, of course you want the readings to be as short as possible. <laughs> but if you're a lady with time on your hands, good big long story is fine. I, I love it. Um, more by token, and, and those of you, none of you have ever been to Athens or Bologna or Paris to study. Uh, so it uh, behooves me to speak more uh, to those who have had their wits wedded than uh, to speak to those who have had their wits wedded by study. Some of you will say that the aforesaid, that is, my stories are full of quips and cranks and quote libits, and that it ill beseemeth a man of weight and gravity to have written such. 
here he's making fun of the whole Abelard tradition of the quote libet, which is how could this be true and that is also true, and turned the question upside down, all scholastic uh, tradition. But to their objection, I rely on this wise. I confess, this is just too funny, to being a man of weight and to having been often weighed in my time. <laughs> Wherefore, speaking to those ladies who have not weighed me, I declare that I am not heavy. Nay, I am so light that I abide like a nutgall in water. And considering that the preachments made of friars to rebuke men of their sins are nowadays for the most part seen full of quips and cranks and jibes. Again, who can uh, doubt but there will be to boot some who say that I have an ill tongue and a venomous, for that I have in sundry places written the truth about friars. And then the last uh, joke in this. The friars are a good sort of folk, who eschew uneasy, unease for the love of God, and who grind with a full head of water and tell no tales. You all know what grind it means in that case, right? Okay. Uh, and but that they save a somewhat of buck goat, their commerce would be far more agreeable. So, uh, other than that, they smell like goats. Uh, he could actually get along with the friars, the friars who screw around and don't tell anybody about it. And then the closing uh, lines. Leaving each of you henceforth to say and believe as seemeth good to her, no, to her, it is time for me to make an end of words, humbly, th humbly thanking him that is God, who hath after so long a labor brought us with his help to the desired end. And you, charming ladies, abide you in peace with his favor, remembering you of me, if perchance it profit any of you ought to have read these stories. So, you like my stories? I think it's just a wonderful um, concluding remark. Well, let's get back to these uh, stories. And uh, so, so Nick and uh, Maxine are going to help me out on this. And I have a sort of laundry list which we want to flesh out a little bit with uh, things that come up in the stories that will make them. I don't want people to have to memorize this stupid mm -hmm. list. It just it just cues to tell us mm -hmm. about things. So. What's going on in a literary sense here? What's new? What's creative? What's, what's breakthrough? Where does this belong in our whole uh, study of, of love and how people write about it, which is what we do in this course? So wonderful is this inversion of love and hate. Lots of the stories um, have that in. I don't think... You know, maybe Pietro, the gossip, maybe that uh, has a little bit of it. But, but there are many stories in which uh, passionate love turns... I think Madonna Filippa is kind of not uh, so in love with her husband, but she's got other things going. Absolutely the, the duality, the, so the pride to humility is another one. Those who are most boastful, most sure about themselves... Those are the ones who, who get their comeuppance. Uh, but that is a, a great sin in Boccaccio's world to be um, greedy. And, and remember, this is right after the plague. And so he's talking about those who are grubbing around, making lots of money. Um, greed. Who, who was, who was going to specialize on the pin the tail on a donkey story? That's you, Nick. So, uh, what, what's going on there? Well, uh, it seems like, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Pietro? Pietro. Pietro is the, uh, the poor man, right? Yeah. Uh, he wants to uh, have his mare become a woman, was it? Or no, his, his, his wife become a mare? Yeah, he needs a donkey in order to get around faster. Because he has, he has right. an ass, right? He, he doesn't. He needs